All right, hello everyone, welcome. Thanks for joining us on this talk where we're gonna talk a lot about the complexities of microservice-based architectures and how information that can be extracted from distributed tracing information, specifically the aggregate information, can be very useful in troubleshooting these types of environments. As the title of the slide indicates, we're actually gonna be using visualization extensively throughout this talk to show some of the power of the aggregate information that you can extract. Now, the claim that we're gonna make is that systems that are moving to more microservices based and some of the biggest cloud providers and vendors in the market today, they're really dealing with the issue of the complexity of their backend infrastructure. And they've really reached the, the level where it's really hard to understand all the nuances of how the architecture works end to end. In fact, I'm sure Yuri will tell you at Uber, probably no one understands how the entire uh, architecture, can, they can frame it in their mind visually from an end to end perspective. But at the end of the day, they do understand how their application functions, and that's critical in order to operate it and make sure that it's available to end users. Like, if you're on the Uber app today, and you're in like some neighborhood that you're not too comfortable with, and the Uber app is like, sorry, we're down for maintenance, you probably wouldn't be very happy about that. And as you think about SaaS-based applications or cloud providers providing cloud services natively to end users, there's kind of an expectation that that service is always available. Like downtime really is not an option, and when downtime happens, it really impacts the business as well as end users' experience. So developers spend a lot of time making sure that their application is highly available. They spend a lot of time testing it before they release to production. They go through fully automated CI/CD delivery pipelines, and they follow really good DevOps culture and best practices to try to minimize the likelihood of an incident or an outage occurring. But at the end of the day, outages are inevitable. In fact, if we look over one month this past summer, we can point out at least four unique significant outages that occurred that were publicly known about from four major vendors or cloud providers. These are big names, companies that you would expect to have this kind of solved. But because they're dealing with really complex architectures, really complex backends that dynamically change, the dependencies between them change, the communication paths change, it can be really difficult to ensure that things are behaving the way that you expect. Now, if you're on call, you have to deal with some of these issues. I guess, quick show of hands, how many people are on call today? Good percentage, maybe 40, 50%. So a fair number of people. This may resonate with you. As part of the on call, one of the most important things that you need to do is actually mitigate the issue as quickly as possible. Sure, you want to know why it happened. You want to prevent it from happening again. You want to learn lessons to improve your processes so that you can ensure that your system is available. But knowing that an outage is going to be inevitable anyway, as an on-call person, you want to mitigate as quickly as possible. The reason for this is because it's impacting your business, could be costing the business a lot of money, and of course, it's impacting end users that are trying to leverage the services that you are pro providing, and they have an expectation that it's available all the time. Now, if you're following some good practices, like for example, you deployed your application in multiple different availability zones, you might be able to do something like failover traffic to a different availability zone to mitigate the issue, but can you really do that without understanding the implications or the blast radius of the current incident that's going on? What happens if that incident's impacting the entire region? well then that mitigation tactic's not gonna help. So at the end of the day, you need to be able to investigate, you need to be able to do it quickly, so you can figure out what happened and where, and then you can get to the why after the fact. Now, that's why we're here today to talk about observability, because observability allows you to ask questions of your system to figure out what's going on. We're gonna spend a lot of time showing you visually how through traces and aggregate information, observability can really lay the groundwork for you to deal with issues in these complex environments. Thanks, Steve. Um, so, as, a, as an agenda for this talk, uh, we will give a little bit more introduction into why distributed tracing, and most people are familiar with it, and we'll go quickly, just really just to make a point, rather than give you an in-depth introduction to tracing. Um, I will talk about, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> well, uh, I, we will talk about um, why, um, uh, so why traces are a very good tool to, to tell you a story about what's going on in your system, right? And then we'll tell you why they're not a good tool. Uh, 
uh, and what we can do better, and especially with the visualizations. And we'll have a time for Q&A, hopefully. So uh, I skip to the slide. So as an introduction, uh, I work at Uber um, at, for about four, 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 four and a half years, uh, all this time on observability team. Uh, and uh, my primary focus is uh, distributed tracing at Uber. Uh, we started the uh, project Jaeger, which is now a CNCF uh, graduated project. We graduated in October. Uh, I also did, like very much involved in open tracing and open telemetry. And so happens I, I wrote a book earlier this year about the tracing. So you can find it on my website if you're interested. It talks about a lot of things related to tracing and how you deploy it, how you run it in production, etc. Uh, and Steve will give a bit more intro for himself. Thank you. And my name is Steve Flanders. I was previously at a company called Omniscient, where I was head of product. Uh, recently, we were acquired by Splunk, so now director of engineering at Splunk. Uh, we've actually helped co-create what's known as the Open Census uh, Collector, or Open Census Service, and the Open Telemetry Collector. These are open source projects that make it really easy to get telemetry data, both metrics and distributed traces in, to process that data and to send it to the back end or back ends of your choice. It actually supports a broad range of open source projects, including Jaeger and Prometheus. It has the ability of performing some advanced features on top of the data it's collecting, including tag addition, as well as redaction, compression, retry, encryption. Features like tail-based sampling are all natively built in. And then it has the ability of sending to a variety of different back ends, both open source and commercial. So it serves as a vendor agnostic way to help collect telemetry information in your environments, and then you can process it in the back end of your choice. If you're interested in learning more about me, I have a blog and Twitter information up as well. All right, so with that, we're gonna kick off the why of distributed tracing. Uh, I guess I'll ask another question. How many people leverage microservices or are moving to a microservices-based architecture in their environment today? Hey, yeah, 80, 90%, not too surprising. Uh, how many of you are leveraging distributed tracing information to observe those environments? Wow, good number of hands, even more than I expected. At least, at least half that percentage raised, raised hands. Now, distributed tracing is very, very powerful because it can help you figure out what's going on in your environment where other telemetry points, they may not be able to. Uh, as Yuri kind of mentioned, we're not gonna cover some of the fundamental pieces of like what distributed tracing is or some of the core concepts like definitions of spans. If you're interested in that information, both Yuri and I have done previous talks at KubeCons, you can look that up. So what I do wanna talk about is why you should care about distributed tracing information. And really it can be summarized in, in these few words. Uh, as we start dealing with more complex microservices-based architectures, those deep systems, if you will, it can be very difficult to figure out what's going on. And if you read any paper on distributed, uh, on distributed systems, you've probably seen the assumption that communication between nodes is unreliable. And in the microservices world, the answer to that is to actually double down on those unreliable connections. So as you move from a monolithic application to a microservices-based application, the number of failure modes and failure possibilities grow exponentially. And you need to be able to deal with these scenarios to ensure that your system is highly available. Now, many of you have probably seen this slide before. Yuri and I actually talked about potentially swapping it out with another image. Uh, but it really does capture the problem statement pretty well, so we decided to keep it in. This is a visual representation of Uber's backend. It's microservices-based. They have north of 3,000 microservices today. This is actually a visual representation depicted from the Jaeger UI. Every circle represents a service. The size of that circle represents the amount of traffic that it's receiving, and then the lines connecting them is the service-to-service -service communication that's going on. Now, if you were to open the Uber app and go ahead and click the button to order an Uber right now, that would go ahead and issue a request through Uber's backend, which would call a variety of different microservices. And of course, depending on the operation that you're doing, whether you're a driver or an end user, whether you're entering payment information, the request paths are gonna be very different. But on the surface, this is basically a request or a trace through the back end system. And things could go wrong at any step there, and you need to understand how the system behaves so you can mitigate that when issues arise. As you can see, distributed transactions can be very complex. This was one example, but there's hundreds of thousands of these happening every second in this environment. And investigation for actual incidents usually starts with a high level business metric. Like for example, let's say the number of uh, Ubers being booked in New York City is currently down. Why? Well, I need to go look at my observability information to really answer those questions. And when the ar architecture is so complex, it's actually hard to troubleshoot the outage and get to root cause quickly. At the end of the day, you want to know what caused it 
but arguably that's usually more, that's usually easier than determining what happened and where it happened in the environment. Think of it this way, I'm a service owner, you tell me there's something wrong with my service, you can reproduce the issue quickly and easily, I probably have ways of investigating that particular issue and mitigating it very quickly. But how did we get to that state where I knew that this service and this particular path was causing all the problems? As an on-call engineer, you typically don't have that insight. So it's your responsibility to quickly figure out what and where in the environment this is happening. This can be extremely difficult and typically takes more time and practice than determining the why and the root cause and remediating that for the long term. Now, this is where observability comes in. And in a way, it's a word that captures the system's ability to really answer questions about the particular environment. This should not be confused with monitoring. Now, there's many different ways to look at the differences between monitoring and observability, but one particular way that I like is monitoring is typically for more of the known knowns. I know what's going to happen. I know the behavior. I have created processes to address these. I have alerts in place to tell me, maybe proactively before they happen. I have run books that articulate how to remediate it, or I have auto-remediation in place. Observability, on the other side, is really for the unknown unknowns. I don't know how the system's going to behave. The system is dynamically changing. I need to be able to ask questions of this telemetry data to figure out what's going on and to actually mitigate issues. So observability is trying to solve a couple key things. What went wrong? Now, if you think about it from a tracing perspective, this typically includes your red metrics or requests, errors, and duration. So this could be issues with uh, an increase in the number of requests, some sort of timeout going on, or an error that's propagating through your system. The where did it go wrong? It could be service to service communication. It could be a dependency on a third party service that you're leveraging. It could be infrastructure related things. And then of course, why did it go wrong? Is this a network contention issue? Is it a deploy issue? It is a configuration issue in my environment. And how can I remediate that very quickly? Now, as it turns out, distributed tracing is actually in a unique position to address all of these problems. And that's because it has context and correlation. So if you look at other telemetry data points like metrics and logs, they can tell you that something happens, but can't necessarily stitch, stitch together the entire picture in a microservices-based architecture. Distributed tracing actually relies on context propagation, so it can. It understands a request through your system as it's calling other microservices. It understands where errors originated from and how they propagate through your stack. This is extremely powerful because it can actually enhance metrics and logs and help you in investigating incidents, doing performance analysis, dealing with the deployment issues and the like. So next, Yuri will walk you through the pros and cons of individual traces, as well as looking at traces in aggregate, and give you some rather detailed examples of how you can leverage the power of distributed tracing information. Thank you. Um, so as I promised, I will go through this section fairly quickly because I assume most people are familiar with it. But the main strength of tracing uh, comes from its ability to reconstruct the path of the request that is it takes through the microservices architecture and visualize it in some uh, this complex transaction so that we can try to reason about this. Uh, and um, and the, answer, the questions that we posed in the previous slide, you can actually try and get to those answers fairly quickly from just a single trace. And so for that, I want to show this is the very classic uh, representation of a distributed tracing view, the Gantt chart, which is a over time sequence diagram where you basically have a timeline left to right, services vertically, and then you uh, plot the, ex the operations that every service is doing. Right? And there are a few things that are very obvious. Like we, we can immediately reason about what was the overall shape of the call graph, like how services are calling each other, because on the left we see there's a hierarchy of calls depicted. Right? Uh, the other thing is that also very obvious is latency is very easy to spot in this case, because clearly this is a blocking operation that takes like three, uh, like. 60% of the overall trace duration. So if you were to optimize it that, or not even optimize it, maybe it's an hour that you're investigating it. So it draws your attention immediately. You don't need to understand much to figure out that this is a bottleneck, right? Uh, it may be another one on a staircase pattern on the right below that as well. There's a bunch of sequential operations could be done in parallel perhaps, so another option. And finally, when there are errors, if you have good instrumentation, uh, then the errors will be captured in the traces and uh, this same Gantt chart, you can sh uh, surface them uh, with some additional annotations saying, okay, there's an error in this uh, operation, you can drill down and to see what, what actually was going on in that, right? And finally, uh, distributed tracing is um, 
an interesting tool because it gives you uh, a macro and micro view of, of, of the transaction. The macro in the sense that you see all the services participating in one transaction and how they interact. And the micro is that at every step you can actually drill down and get very rich information about each step. For example, here we can see SQL queries, you can get a bunch of logs, uh, all tightly correlated with a single execution. Um, so to summarize, a single trace is, is by itself is still a very powerful tool if you can use it correctly, right? It, it, it tells you a story of a transaction um, and uh, it's, um, It, it allows you to sort of drill down into for individual details of every operation uh, and, and reason about them. Um, and um, finally, if you are like used to debugging something in a, in a monolith applications, then you probably always look for stack trace. Like now imagine you have microservices and you don't have a stack trace. So distributed tracing actually acts as a stack trace, so that single trace view is sort of, you can think of it as a stack trace, right? However, uh, that same view has a couple of challenges which are actually uh, what sometimes make tracing not as effective as Suman previously mentioned in his talk, right? And one of them is, well, in order to uh, troubleshoot the problem in production, you need to have a representative trace, like something that actually happens and uh, the, the, when you start looking at the trace, it has to represent correctly what would the behavior or the erroneous behavior of the system. But how do you get to that? Maybe the trace that you picked up, even if you looked at the, some, some parameters of it, it could still be anomaly rather than the steady state behavior, whether good or bad. Um, and the second issue is in the um, more complex and deep systems, the traces themselves are actually becoming so complex that the Gantt chart is becoming just too unwieldy to, to use by itself. Um, I will, in this example, this is a real production trace from Uber. Um, it's probably like um, one of the front end requests, uh, like either pickup or uh, maybe upstart. So there are 30 more or more services involved in that trace, uh, more than 100 RPC calls. And this is a concise um, representation of that call graph, uh, a bit condensed. So imagine if you go back to the Gantt chart of that thing. Well. Even the, the number of steps in this is gonna take you like multiple pages of scrolling through, through the Gantt chart. Plus, uh, there are so many operations going on that every one individual operation is gonna be tiny. So you're really not even gonna see much on that trace. So if you know which specific region you want to zoom in, you can obviously zoom in and get rich details. But on the top surface, if you are in the outer situation and need to find out quickly what's going on wrong, it's very hard still. Um, and. Uh, and uh, this is not like the most complex trace. Like some of the Amazon homepage traces have like, I don't know, several hundred services involved, right? So, um, so what, what we're trying to solve uh, uh, in, with the solutions in this talk is really trying to uh, attribute the failure to a specific place in the architecture because we said this is one of the most challenging problems. Um, and uh, how do we do that? Well, looking at one thing is not the best thing. Like if you get a pull request or a patch, you're not gonna apply it to your source code and then start reading source code front to end, right? Which is what we're doing with a single trace. Uh, instead, you're gonna look at the differences. Uh, and the same thing if you perform an optimization, let's say memory leak, you take a snapshot before, snapshot after, you compare them, you look at the differences. So we wanna do the same thing with traces, look at the differences because that will highlight us a lot quicker some of the things that may be going wrong. And I presented it last year, so again, I'm not gonna go very uh, long on this one, but uh, one of the things that we've built in Jaeger and open source is a comparison of traces where you can structurally compare to, to traces and using the typical like uh, code diff color code in red missing notes, green extra notes, right? So your attention is immediately drawn to the bottom part of this saying, oh, there's something going on with that execution, right? Like a bunch of calls that normally happens on the left side didn't happen on the right side. So this is a kind of simple visualization allows you to, to drill down into a problem much quicker. And color coding could be different. You could, for example, if you investigate in a latency, then again, we can use a heat map color coding here, and you can see immediately the red path of the nodes. Again, these are differences, right? So uh, one of those nodes which are in gray could be actually taking 80% of your total transaction, but that 80% may be normal every day, whereas the things that are in red are different between these two things, and that's what you wanna focus on when you're investigating things. Um, and so, nonetheless, these two differences, uh, different views, they still have, um, kind of the same challenge is that individual traces could be outliers, now we have two of them, but we still have to pick them somehow. And it's up to the user to actually pick the right one, uh, which is not great. Um, so the question is, can we do better? 
Uh, what if the system kind of did that for us and we didn't have to guess? Um, and so that's uh, the approach that I want to talk about here. Uh, so we want to use, uh, and we built that at Uber, by the way, it's an introduction. So we want to uh, aggregate a bunch of traces that we know represent a good behavior of the system, and we learn from them a statistical model of that behavior. And then when something bad happens, we can take that bad request and overlay it with the good model and compare them and see what the differences are, right? Um, but when we uh, create this good model, first we, we're doing it in a business-specific way. This is, by the way, this tool is not open source because it's really tied to the, the way the Uber does business. Um, and I'll talk about this uh, a bit in, a, in a bit more. So uh, the way this uh, monitoring solution works, it's, it's called black box monitoring, really. So we have uh, Uber users, drivers and riders. They have their phones. Their phones talking to the Uber backend all the time, right? This is production. And what if we did the same thing, but with a synthetic uh, kind of a black box prober, which simulates the same executions? Um, and it does that in the whole scenario, say, in the rider, uh, like driver coming online, rider asking for a request, uh, driver accepting the request, going to pick up, the whole sequence of steps. Uh, when, uh, when the uh, execution simulates this, it kind of knows uh, what they expect to the system, from the system, and when something breaks, it can flag it. And so we have traces immediately from that that we can use for, for the approach that I'm discussing. And by the way, the reason the Uber built this uh, is not specifically for tracing or even outage uh, resolution. It was actually for outage detection. Uber is a very cent city centric uh, business. Like, if you go to another city, there's probably going to be hundreds of different experiments running which are not like in New York. Uh, and uh, there's tons of features that may be enabled on a per city level. So, if you think about how all those features affect the call graph in the back end, uh, you, you may have very different call, call graphs or distributed traces between New York and San Francisco, for example. Right? And so the prober is, is specific to the city. So it executes the execution in one city, so it knows what to expect within that city. And that way it can build a logical model of what the normal execution looks like uh, gradually. I mean, it it's uses time, time sliding windows, so if something changes, it will readjust itself. Um, and so, but when uh, this black monitor, so it, it was very helpful for us in uh, isolating the outages. Sometimes we couldn't even detect an outage from the usual metrics because if it happens in one of the cities and Uber supports like a thousand cities, then you may not notice the blip on the metrics, but with the specific like test within the city, it fails and we can, we can raise an alert to people, right? Uh, but once that alert goes off, we're back to that same problem. Okay, then now what? We have 3,000 services. How do you go and debug what's actually causing the issue? Um, and, and that's where this, um, the test executor actually is, uh, is tied to the tracing because every request it sends it's tra is traced. It's a synthetic traffic, we can afford to trace all of it, right? And so it executes specific business scenarios which allow us to form the baseline. Uh, the, city, the baseline for one city may be different from another one, doesn't matter, but, but we still keep them. Uh, and then when some step, steps fail, uh, it gives us a trace which has like a clear signal, yes, this is a bad trace, or while the other ones were good traces. Uh, which leads us um, to this um, architecture where the test executor constantly running these tests and sending the data to, uh, well, the, the, the data is being collected as for, in the form of traces uh, in the Jaeger. Um, and then we have this extra aggregator which kind of keeps the good traces from the black box and says, okay, from the good ones, I'm going to construct a statistical model of what the normal execution looks like. Uh, and then when the text executor says, oh no, this is a bad trace, it tags the trace with a special sig signal that we can detect in the back end, uh, it, it indicates a, a failure. So then now we have two basically pieces that we can compare fully automatically. We didn't have human involved in, in choosing either of those, right? And so we do the difference, and then we can investigate, let the human investigate the difference only. Um, and the visualization for the difference is very similar to what, uh, what I showed before, uh, but again, there is no human choice involved in selecting the pieces to diff in this case, right? Um, it is, it's not shown on the screenshot, but on the left you actually have those steps that uh, constitute the scenario. Uh, so you can, you can get like, uh, select individual steps and every step has its own call graph. Um, uh, so this one is just a call uh, graph for a single step. So at the top we can see this is the specific operation name that was done. So again, multiple steps, you know which one is, is failing. Um, you can also see on the right, uh, is there's a link back to Jaeger 
uh, where, because again, we, we have a bad trace that we're comparing with the model, we can actually go and look into that bad trace and get all the rich information that we typically get from a single trace, especially if you know where to look in it. And here, we do know where to look for it because every node in this graph can be deep linked into the trace uh, because they're all like uh, connected. Um, so the nodes themselves, this is again, this is just a cold graph with nodes uh, chronologically sorted. Some of the nodes are collapsed because if you have a service call on another service multiple times, we don't want to show that it's gonna get too noisy. Uh, again, as I mentioned, like hundreds RPC calls, there's fewer nodes definitely here than in the actual trace. So that, that's what makes this visualization actually consumable by human. Um, and finally, uh, with the color coding, white means Looks okay, but black means the nodes are missing in the, in the failed execution, right? It's actually interesting, like we didn't use red and green here because it's very unusual in this tool to have extra nodes in the failed trace because typically a failed scenario means you didn't execute some of the steps that normally get executed. Uh, but we could have used color coding with red and green as well here. Uh, but we just reserved the red for the errors and so you can um, see that, okay, this node represents two spans uh, each of them had errors in them. And, and on the right side, we can kind of drill down without leaving the tool to see what specific error messages were recorded in those steps. And so again, if you look at uh, visually at this graph, you kind of see again, okay, well, the, the black top uh, section at the top is sort of some things that didn't go well right away. There are some errors, so there's a few nodes that you may click around and, and figure out, okay, well, this is the, the problematic area that I want to investigate. Uh, you can actually run machine learning on these diffs afterwards, but that's probably for the next year if, we, if production lies. Um, and so in summary, uh, the visual comparisons uh, are a very useful tool for, for actually making trace, distributed tracing information uh, useful. One of them is they surface a lot, more inf a lot less information by condensing it. Uh, and they emphasize the differences rather than showing us the whole picture and then figuring out what, what to do. Um, and when we compare with aggregations, it gives us additional features like we actually looking at, uh, we, we rule out outliers from this comparison, right? Because we don't have to worry about them. And finally, this tool was specifically done to uh, attribute failures much quicker than normal production would allow us to do because it used to take our operations like 30 minutes to figure out which services is misbehaving. Now they're down to two minutes with this tool. So we're kind of running out of time, yeah. Um, okay, so I'll um, give it to Steve to go very quickly now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're right close to time, so I'll kind of, kind of go through this information very quickly. I uh, wanted to show some aggregate analysis leveraging visualizations, all powered by distributed tracing information. So as I mentioned, in microservices-based archi architectures, complexity makes it very hard to troubleshoot from an on-call perspective, but one of the main problems you're trying to solve for is what I like to call the who-to-wake-up problem. Uh, as you have multiple microservices, it's not uncommon that if one microservice has an issue, that upstream and downstream microservices from that service experience issues at the same time. And as you move to more polyglot architectures, you kind of decouple and have different service owner teams. Um, from an on-call perspective, you only want to wake up the people that, where the issue's actually happening from. In distributed tracing, it's actually possible because you have context and correlation. You know where the error originated from, and that means you can actually show it on a service graph. Uh, so here's an example where every circle represents a service. The size of the service, again, represents the amount of traffic it's receiving, and the arrows indicate the directionality of traffic. You can clearly see here that the currency service is experiencing a large number of errors. You can also see that the checkout service is seeing errors, but not actually originating them. They're actually propagating from the currency service. So in this particular case, if we were to page non-call, it's really the currency service that we want to get involved to figure out what's going on. Now, in order to figure out what's going on, we have to get to problem isolation. And so in addition to the typical red metrics that you can get out of distributed tracing information, like the requests and the errors and the duration, you can actually tag rich metadata onto your spans as well. This could be build information, infrastructure, environments it's deployed on, whatever is applicable to the application that you're running, and then you can start asking questions of your data. Like for example, if I just look at the currency service and its dependencies and I break down the currency service, I can see that it's running in two different regions and only one region is having an issue. This is helping me isolate the problem and focus my efforts really where the problem is happening from. If I wanna take that one step further, there are actually nested levels of metadata. So maybe I then wanna know for that given region, which Kubernetes pods is this service deployed on and are any of them being impacted? This nested analysis or going like multiple layers deep is also critical from an analysis perspective to help isolate the problem. And here we can quickly see there's actually only a single pod 
in the US West 2 region that's experiencing issues. Now, as an on-call person, if my responsibility is really to mitigate the issue, I now have some options. I could terminate that pod, I can quarantine that host, I can try to get the system back online, and then I can take the why of why this happened in the first place offline and get to my root cause after the effect. So it's really critical that you have the ability to ask any question of your data, and that means you have to enrich it with uh, things like things that are applicable to your particular environments. This could be like tag analysis and breaking it down by all the additional, additional metadata that you add to the spans. This could be from a performance standpoint, looking at the performance across its different dimensions, uh, as well as also looking at things like metric comparisons, where I'm actually looking at metrics that are being extracted from the rich distributed tracing data that I'm collecting. Finally, this doesn't just apply to incident management or performance analysis. It also applies to like CI CD pipelines and continuous deployments. Like if you're doing a canary release, you want to be able to compare that against what you currently have running in production and be able to determine very quickly and easily whether or not there's an issue and whether or not you need to roll back. Again, distributed tracing is in a unique position to really help answer these questions. If you just add like a version number tag to the spans for your service, you can start answering that question because you have baseline information about how a previous version is behaving and you can compare that against the canary release that you're rolling out. So from a takeaways perspective, really, Distributed tracing makes it possible to deal with the complexities of a microservices-based architecture. It provides the missing link of context and correlation that's critical from an observability standpoint and can help highlight and enhance the metrics and logs that you're likely leveraging today. It's really the aggregate analysis, though, that you get the most value from. Individual traces can be valuable, but you want to understand how it behaves in the system overall. And really these creative visualizations makes it much easier to consume the distributed tracing data that you have so you can actually ask the questions that you care about. So definitely take a look at distributed tracing options that are out there. As you move to microservices, you'll probably see that it really provides some rich insights and curious to see what others come up with from a visualization standpoint in order to really enhance the data that they're collecting. And with that, I think we're at time, but thank you so much.